Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Chester Arthur, and the focus is what to expect from the unlikeliest president ever. The year is 1881. It's September, and President James Garfield has just died 80 days after being gunned down by the assassin Charles Guiteau. Chester Arthur is in his home. He's ready to take the oath of office to become the president. He has his son Alan by his side. The judge is John Brady, who swears him in September 19th, 1881. And Chester Arthur, the 21st president, is fundamentally terrified. This is not the job that he wanted. He had no political experience outside of the New York machine politics. He had no policies, no ideology. He was out of his league and he knew it, yet here he was. He's going to do the best he could. Chester Arthur was about to head to Washington, D.C., but he had to take one action first in his mind because perhaps unique in all of American history at this moment, there was no one in the line of secession for the presidency in case anything happened to him because Congress had not yet organized for this congressional session. And at the time, the line of secession simply went president to vice president to president pro temp of the Senate and speaker of the House. Right now, there was no president pro temp of the Senate. There was no speaker of the House. So what Arthur did is he wrote a letter to the White House and he basically said he was calling the Senate into special emergency session if anything happened to him so they could pick a president pro temp who would then become the president. If Arthur arrived in D.C. Uh, and everything was OK, they would destroy that letter. He would call the Senate into special session through normal channels and that, of course, is what happened, but he did take this precaution just in case. He also then took his oath of office again in front of Chief Justice Morrison Waite in the vice president's office in the Capitol. He followed that with a few remarks for the people standing by, sort of an inaugural address, in which Arthur said, summoned to these high duties and responsibilities and profoundly conscious of their magnitude and gravity, I assume the trust imposed by the Constitution, relying for aid on divine guidance and the virtue, patriotism, and intelligence of the American people. Now, Chester Arthur would not not move into the White House just yet, because in his view, it needed repairs. In fact, it needed renovation pretty seriously, and Chester Arthur took this seriously. He went every night to the White House to supervise these re renovations. It took three full months to do so. It was not until December when he moved into the White House, at which point 24 wagon loads of old furniture were taken out of that building. But again, what to expect from Chester Arthur as president? And a lot of eyes were figuring what's going to do with his cabinet and what is he going to do with Roscoe Conkling, his longtime political boss? Well, the Garfield cabinet was not aligned much with Arthur. He asked all of them to stay at least till the end of the year. Some said yes, some said no. But again, people were still jockeying around what's he going to do with Roscoe Conkling. So Arthur and Conkling met, and Conkling wasn't actually putting the cabinet or national interests on, his, on the table. He was focusing on patronage in New York. He wanted Arthur to fire the new collector of the of the New York Custom House, the job that Arthur had had a couple of terms ago, and now was in the hands of William Robertson, who James Garfield had put in that office over Conkling's objections in the Senate, and Conkling wanted Arthur to get rid of Robertson, give him that position to turn over the patronage in New York to Roscoe Conkling. So what would Chester Arthur do? Who was running this White House? Was it Chester Arthur or was it Roscoe Conkling, the New York machine or an independent-minded commander-in-chief? And surprise, surprise, the, shock, the shock, shock of many, including Roscoe Conkling, is Chester Arthur turned down his boss. He said he was morally bound to continue the policy of the former president, and he refused to remove Robertson. He, in fact, knew that would be the end of his presidency. Nobody would give him any credibility going forward if he had done that. So he decided not to when he began to change his stripes to put the country first. He said, for the vice presidency, I was indebted to Mr. Conkling. But for the presidency of the United States, my debt is to the Almighty, and he was beginning to move in a new direction. Well, the Senate came together in that special session. They settled upon David Davis of, of Illinois as the president pro temp. And then Arthur sent all the outstanding nominees from Garfield 
back to the Senate. He was again furthering his commitment to James Garfield's presidency. But again, the focus, what about the cabinet? Some of them wanted out. William Wyndon, for example, the Secretary of the Treasury, didn't want to have anything to do with Chester Arthur, and so Arthur had to make an immediate replacement, and for that, he went back to his old patron, the former governor and, and senator from New York, Edwin Morgan. He nominated him, he was confirmed by the Senate, but Morgan said no. He said, look, my health is not up to this. So Arthur went to his backup plan, which was Charles Folger, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New York and a longtime friend of Arthur's. Folger was confirmed as Treasury Secretary. Next up, also wanting out right away, was Wayne McVeigh, the Attorney General. Okay, Benjamin Brewster, you're going to get the nominee from Chester Arthur, and he was confirmed. But all eyes were on James Blaine, the Secretary of State. And James Blaine didn't want to have anything to do with an Arthur presidency. He was aligned with Garfield, and he still wanted to be president himself. And he thought the best way to get there was actually outside of an, uh, an Arthur administration. He, of course, was leery of Roscoe Conkling. They were politically at odds, so he wanted out. The question then would be, who would Arthur put in his place? And this was the second test for Arthur when it came to Conkling, because Conkling was telling colleagues that he was going to be the Secretary of State. He was going to get back all that patronage for New York and kind of be the power behind the throne of the Arthur presidency. So what did Chester Arthur do? Well, shock number two, he chose his independence. He sent Roscoe Conkling back to New York. No cabinet position, no uh, firing of the a collector of the, of the New York Custom House. These were some of the boldest moves ever in the life of the machine politician Chester Arthur. One of his fellow machine politicians, John O'Brien, made the statement, he isn't Chet Arthur anymore. He's the president and must demonstrate that he's nobody's servant, and that's in fact exactly what Chester Arthur was doing. He took a recommendation from Ulysses Grant to go with Frederick Frelinghausen of New Jersey as his choice for Secretary of State. Turned out to be an excellent choice, as Frelinghausen did uh, work very closely with Arthur on four Foreign Affairs Matters. Look, the entire cabinet would turn over except for one person in less than a year. And that one person was Robert Lincoln, the son of the former president, who stayed as Secretary of War for all four years. But Arthur managed through this change and picked some pretty good people to come in and help him get through his presidency. Now, what about policies? The policies of the president matter. And Chester Arthur really, for the first time, put out his policies in his first annual message in December of 1881. Now, this was a pretty robust policy statement. Statement. It was substantive. It covered both foreign and domestic policies. He actually had an agenda. It started with the Treasury, which has been overflowing with cash over the last few years. And Arthur thought the right answer was to reduce taxes, to bring down both internal taxes and the tariff. Now, Congress didn't take any immediate action on this, but they did agree to establish a commission to study it. Number two for Arthur was his push to expand the U.S. Navy. The Navy was in disrepair and had been since the end of the Civil War. It was down to only 52 ships. They were all made of wood. They were powered by sail. The rest of the world had moved on in the Navy. They were building ships of steel with steam engines. And Chester Arthur, consistently throughout his term in office, was pushing Congress to help rebuild the U.S. Navy. Next up. Indian relations. And Chester Arthur proposed some new legal protections for the Indians. And he also proposed giving land, but not to the tribes, but to the individual Indians themselves. He thought that would help them become more assimilated into the U.S. culture. He continued to advocate this throughout his presidency, but the fact is he made very little progress in this particular area. The most important area, and what people really wanted to know, was where was Chester, Chester Arthur going to stand on civil service reform? Would the former spoilsman embrace reform, or would he take a step back and hand the power back to the political bosses? Most expected the latter, but Chester Arthur continued to surprise. He became an advocate for civil service reform. Now, it was not unconditional. He still didn't like competitive examinations as a way to find people their jobs, but he was open to reform, and he basically said, ball is in your court, Congress, 
I'll take a look at what you, what you put forward, but he seemed to be inclined that he would support at least some reform. Now, the conscience of the Chester Arthur presidency continued to be Julius Sand, the invalid woman in New York City who had been writing him letters both to sort of knock him down and rise him up, trying to get the best out of him. And on this topic, she said, the vital question before the country is civil service reform. The vital question before you is how you will meet it. Evasion in any form will be a proof of weakness. Are you a coward? It is for you to choose. Are you content to sit like a snake charmer and let loathsome serpents coil about you? I would rather think of you like St. George in shining armor, striking death to the heart of the dragon. Sand continued to write. She continued to knock him down, trying to rise her up, raise him up. Now, interestingly, Chester Arthur clearly paid attention to these letters. They meant something to him because he saved them. He burned all his papers. Two days before he died, he did not burn any of the Julius Sand letters. Well, he was now finally in the White House trying to make some of these decisions. And in the White House with him, he had some family. He had his daughter, Nell. She's only 10 years old. He kept her mostly out of sight. That was quite intentional. And she was being watched by Arthur's sister, Mary McElroy, who was basically the White House hostess for him during his presidency, which was about the only part of the presidency that Arthur really liked, the social activities. This was important to him. He enjoyed enjoyed this. As for Arthur's son, Alan, well, he was off to school. He was at what we now call Princeton, the College of New Jersey at the time. He would often visit his father, though, in the White House. And also, Chester Arthur was still missing his wife. He was still sad over the loss of his wife, Nell, of 20 years together. She had been dead now about a year and a half. He decided to actually purchase a window in her name at St. John's Church, just across the street from the White House. He would gaze out that window on occasion, look at that window, think of her. He also had fresh cut flowers brought into the White House every day, particularly to adorn a picture of his beloved wife. For Arthur, the best part of the, of the presidency, as I mentioned, was in the social aspect. And the first major social activity he planned was to honor the former president, Ulysses Grant. Him and his wife, Julia, came to the White House for a large gathering, a 17-course meal, six kinds of wine. Chester Arthur knew how to throw a party. And he loved these parties where the men would stay together afterwards, drinking, smoking cigars, telling stories. This was Arthur's revelry period, but it was also his way to do avoid anything but doing the work. Chester Arthur hated making the decisions that came with the presidency because, frankly, somebody was always upset with him, no matter what he decided. One of his clerks said, Pres President Arthur never did today what he could put off until tomorrow, in part because Arthur just didn't want to make these decisions and get people mad at him. The irony of much of this is that one of the things as president Arthur hated most was patronage, handing out all those jobs that he had spent a lifetime pursuing. But now we found out when he was making the decision, just about every job he handed out, there were a whole bunch of people who were upset who didn't get the job. He just wanted nothing to do with this after spending a lifetime pursuing it. He couldn't get rid of that part of the job. He couldn't get rid of any of the jobs. He was the president of the United States. And this topic of civil service reform, well, it was going to keep coming coming at him, but that's a story for another day. That is Chester Arthur and what to expect from the unlikeliest president ever. From the life of Chester Arthur, for more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.